Welcome back. This is part two in my video about my Amscope trinocular microscope that I'm using for watchmaking. I put up a demo video of the first time that I used the microscope and I got back some tremendous feedback. So I just want to thank you all for you know watching and, and giving me some really valuable feedback. In this video, we're going to do a few follow-up items. Um, first is Real quickly, I'm going to talk about a noise problem, uh, audio noise, that I was having with one of my cameras after adding the microscope into the mix, and I'll, I fixed it, and I'm going to tell you how I fixed it. Second is um, the working distance of this microscope is a, a little bit close when I was working under the microscope. So my tweezers are taller than the distance from my light and the lens to the subject. So I was kind of having to, you know, move around and, and tilt the microscope. And I completely forgot that this microscope comes with two lenses called Barlow lenses. A Barlow lens is a lens that screws onto the very bottom part of the microscope, right between the, uh, the microscope lens and the subject. And it is like a wide angle lens, um, this particular Barlow lens. Um, this is a 0.5, we're going to give this a try. It will decrease the magnification, but it will increase the distance that you have to work with on the microscope. Now, right now I'm, I'm working on a platform. Can you see the back of this platform here? This is, this is about four inches off of the desk. So I'm hoping that by adding this Barlow lens, it will allow me to raise up the micro, uh, the microscope further away from the subject. And that will give me more clearance. And that comes at the expense of uh, losing some magnification. So we're going to try this Barlow lens and just for reference, so right now the working distance when focused is about 90 millimeters from the bottom of the ring light. So we'll measure again after adding the Barlow lens. Okay, so that's one thing that we're going to tackle. Number two is the issue of color balance. Um, when I'm filming video, I'm using several cameras and to make all of the different cameras look, you know, as close as we can to the same, I have everything set at the same uh, white balance. Now, white balance, as you know, white light can either be like bluish or yellowish, either warm or cool. And I have all my cameras in my studio lighting set to a warmish, um, I use Kelvin, 4300 Kelvin for all of the cameras. The light on this microscope is extremely blue. When this microscope light is off and like my hands are here in the picture, um, you know, all of the flesh tones are, you know, hopefully nice and, and I look healthy and, you know, somewhere between pink and tan. Now, when I turn on the ring light, it's extremely blue. It just makes me look like I either have frostbite or I'm a smurf. And what we're going to do is we're going to try to adjust the color temperature of this ring light by putting a gel underneath the light. When you have blue light, in order to make it a warmer color, um, you add kind of an orange or an amber or a, a straw color filter to it. You know, I know this sounds like a small detail, but, but the point is I, I want the colors, when you put color underneath here, I want anything that I hold up to the camera to look one way in front of the camera, and then I want it to look the same color when I put it here under the microscope. And, and right now this is turning everything blue. And then finally, once I get all of those in place, I'm going to continue disassembling that lady's bulova under the microscope, completely um, looking through the, the eyepieces as much as I can just to continue getting used to it. Hopefully, if that Barlow lens works, I'll be able to get rid of this four inch platform and you know work a little bit lower. One note on why it's important to me to control these working distances, in addition to being able to have clearance and dexterity, I also find that posture 
and like body positioning and, and where your chair is set, it's extremely important. If you are spending hours head down working on watchmaking, using good form when you are doing these activities is the best way to start. So hopefully by using the microscope, give me better vision so I don't have to scrunch down like this with a loop as much as I have been. Um, that should help my form. That should help my overall health. And the extra vision of working under the microscope should improve my watchmaking skills. So that's the plan for this video. Thanks for watching. Here we go. I mentioned that when I hooked the camera on the microscope into my system, um, I developed a noise problem. Here's an example of the sound problem that I had when I was recording using all of the cameras at the same time. Insert clip. For scale, that is a, uh, a US dime, just to give you an idea of how big this, um, this watch is, this movement is. What's going on here is when you power equipment via five volt USB, whatever the, the voltage DC converters are in there, they're extremely noisy, especially if you're using an audio interface or if you're recording computer audio. Now I'm using an audio interface, which is then feeding my studio microphone into my cameras. But here's what's going on. I'm also using HDMI to connect all of my cameras into a switcher so I can combine the images on a single screen. This camera has two choices for powering it. 12 volts DC or five volts USB. So what was happening is the USB power that was powering the camera, it was sending noise through the HDMI cable. The HDMI cable comes down here into my HDMI switcher. This interface was picking up a buzz because the five volt USB power was traveling down the ground of the HDMI. So I was able to reduce the noise in two ways. First was I grounded the chassis of this switcher to the chassis of my audio interface. That reduced the noise. And then the second thing that I did is I switched from using the USB power, which is right there, to using this, which is a 12 volt power, which simply comes from one of these wall warts. Using the 12 volt in instead of the five volt USB, um, that completely made for clean audio. I don't know if that's a long-winded explanation, but if you have this problem, it can be very frustrating to troubleshoot. So hopefully this little snippet will help anyone who runs into this issue. Okay. Let's try attaching the Barlow lens. Don't know if that's just a, uh, a single element. It just seems to be like a, a demagnifier. I'm assuming we can just go right on with this. There we go. And anytime you're putting filters or threaded lenses on any piece of equipment, just go slow and steady. The, um, the threads, the threads on optical equipment are so fine. You could easily cross thread and, and really mess up both the uh, lens or filter. So really take your time to ensure that the threads are lined up. And then uh, when you get it on, just fingertip tight, fingertip tight is all you need. Okay. We'll reattach the ring light. Okay, ring light is reattached. Let me bring my power back to the ring light. So there is no way right now to focus the microscope on the, uh, on the dime. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. I'm gonna remove my work platform here. 
platform out. We'll put our work surface back and let's move our, move our dime back into the picture. Holy crow, look at that. Well, I gotta tell you that, that just dropped into focus like right away. <laughs> Boy, we, we nailed it. Look at that. Wow. I have huge clearance right now. How much? We were at 90. I'll just mark it right there. Show it to the camera. There we go. 200, more than 210 millimeters of work distance. Now, that's huge. What does that mean? That, that means I can use my tweezers all day. Look at that. So as you can imagine, a microscope like this takes up a big chunk of real estate in your work area. So I didn't show this in my last video, but let me show it to you now. So this microscope, it has a boom arm. You can slide it back this way. So you, you can basically turn it to get it out of the way. And, and, you know, when I shoot on that front camera, I will now be able to push this out of the way. So if I don't want the microscope in the shot, don't worry about it. Um, but when I do want it in the shot, um, I, I want to be able to move it front and back as well as swivel it. And so I have this little accessory. Um, this tray actually allows me to very easily move the microscope back. And then when I want to use it to move it forward. So what is this? This is, this is a, um, basically a kitchen mixer stand. Um, it has wheels and feet underneath it. And when you push down on this little paddle in the front, it lifts the platform onto the wheels and you can then slide it where you want to. And then when you let go of the paddle, it locks it very securely in place. So that's actually what I wanted to do there was move it forward. So now I can pull this out more comfortably over my work area. So let's see, now that we've made those adjustments, fantastic, look at that, I have focus. And I can come in here and I can do my work. Very nice, and, and my posture is good. In fact, I can, I can lower my chair just a little bit. If you have a microscope or, or anytime you're doing watchmaking, I highly recommend a, uh, a chair that is height adjustable. I don't know if, if that's just obvious, but as long as we're talking ergonomics, I thought I'd mention it. Okay, so there we go. I've got lots of clearance now. I can move around. You know what else? That This is also good because I'll be able to see the, uh, the subject with my cameras better now because I'm, I'm further away. Okay, Barlow lens, a huge win. Next on the list, um, we're going to color balance the uh, the ring light on here um, just to try to tie the light coming out of the ring light in with all of the other studio lighting. Got the ring light off, and at first I thought I would just uh, cut a donut out of the gel material and just tape it in front, but I think this lens comes off. So if we can get the lens off, then I'm gonna put the, uh, put the gel under the lens, between the lights and the lens. So it looks like there's just a couple of tabs here. So I'm just gonna trace the outline on the cardboard and then I'll just need to cut a little bit inside those lines. Okay, we have a donut. So now we just have to uh, make sure that we cut something smaller. And I'll just make myself some guides here. And if it's, if it's too big, we can just trim with scissors. Just give myself a little helper here.
Let's see, does that want to pop out? I don't want to untape it. Yep, it's going to pop. Good. Pop it out. There we go. How close did we get? Let's see. Dang, Mike. Mike, you did all right. Let's line up our tabs. There are four tabs, one, two, three, four. Just ease this back in. Okay, there we go. Tungsten balanced uh, LED light. I think that looks much more natural. I keep a, a white piece of cardstock that I use for white balancing all of my cameras. So you can see that it kind of comes out yellow now that we have that uh, gel in the ring light. So let me stop recording and I'll reset the white balance on the camera and then we'll, we'll join up on the other side. Okay, so we are recording on the microscope again. There we go, that's, that's much closer to uh, my actual skin tone. So now when we put something under the microscope, hopefully it will be accurately represented on all of the cameras. Excellent. White balancing the ring light, a success. We're back, it's the next day, and um, we're gonna open the bull of a watch. But there was one more thing that I thought of that I wanted to modify on this microscope. It, it's been driving me a little bit crazy. Let me explain what it is. The eyepieces on the microscope, they, uh, they rotate freely. This has nothing to do with focus. They're just spinning. And they're held in place with a Phillips head set screw. And the set screw is tightened, but listen, they, they wobble around. Now, why that's not good for me is every time I lean in to do a recording and I position my glasses against the rubber eye cups, it's making a little clicking sound, which just isn't good production value. So here's what we're gonna do. I have a proposed idea. I'm gonna loosen the set screw. And that allows you to uh, take the eye cup out. What I'm planning to do is put a, uh, a watch gasket right there on the shoulder where the, uh, the eyepiece rests against the, uh, the other part of the eyepiece. So we'll do a quick measure on here. And uh, fortunately in watchmaking, we have gaskets. 29.83, we'll call this a 30 millimeter span. There's some uh, 30 millimeter O-rings. So I'm just gonna take one of these and we're gonna stretch it on. And we just wanna make sure that it's seated on that shoulder. Okay, there we go. It's black on black. I really don't think you'll be able to see it on the camera but will we be able to hear the difference on the microphone? So there we go, we'll settle it in place. I will reset the set screw tight. And now we can still turn it. There, there's no real reason to turn it. It doesn't affect focus, but, oh yeah. Yeah, now we're talking much better. Okay, before, after. That's what we wanted to hear. We're not here. Set screw set. Still turns. Oh, beautiful. The sound of silence. Okay. Seems to be a never ending stream of modifications just to make it your own. But there you go, one more. That was a quick fix. Success, let's get on with it. Let's dig into this bull of a movement. 
So here we go. This is the uh, Bulova Ladies Movement that I started taking apart in my first microscope video. Uh, this is a 6BL, uh, tiny, 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 tiny movement. I use this for scale. This is a US 10 cent dime. Before we take this apart, there is something that I wanted to investigate. As you might know, on the back of a movement, there's some access points. And these access points are for maintenance, usually oiling. And I thought that when we have this on the microscope, that would be a good opportunity to take a look at some of those access points. As you can see down here, there is a jewel behind the escape wheel. So this lets you get to that jewel. And, and what is that? Is it one of the important wheels? Come on, Mike, they're all important wheels at any rate. So there's this access port that lets you um, get right in there to oil from the back. There's an access point here. And there's an access point. Let's see if that one's there. Right there. You can see the, um, the jewels on the pallet fork. And there's one jewel. There's the other jewel. Now, the importance of this is that when you're lubricating a watch, once everything's back together, you want to put a drop of oil just on the very tip of that jewel. Let's see, can we zoom in? So here's the pallet stone. You just need to apply a drop of oil to the tip you would then advance the escape wheel about five clicks and then you would flip the movement over and uh, reapply another drop of oil on the end of that pallet stone that's where we would want to come in the back way and put that dab of oil on there. And so that would be the process. So I struggled with this in the past, um, just for coordination reasons and access reasons. Uh, but this microscope makes this process seem all more accessible. Excellent. Now I mentioned in, uh, in my last video, I acknowledge that I'm not wearing finger cots just because this is a play movement. I'm not planning on rebuilding this. And it's uh, it's plenty dirty, so I'm not too worried about it. So let's see if we can remove the fragile pallet fork. Okay, underneath. Oh, there we go. Have to go off the microscope. Got him. Very gently, let's see if we can find a pry point here. Very gently. There we go. Now I'm working just through the microscope. Okay, we lift him away. Pallet fork. Can we sneak him out? And with him out, you can see that the, uh, the train of wheels is spinning freely. Okay, so the crown is here. So here's the crown wheel. Now this is often a reverse threaded screw. Let's see, how do we do on screwdrivers? Okay, we have a bite there. Okay, now I'm gonna hold him down and, yes, this is reverse threaded. So you turn him clockwise. There we go, and I feel like that's just come loose. So here's that screw. That holds in the crown wheel. So here is that crown wheel. Now sometimes there's a little inner filler washer there. I don't see one on this watch. So let's take a look at the other side of them. 
And does he have all his teeth? Good. Lucky to have all of his teeth for as old as he is. And just for giggles, let's see. What if we zoom in just to do a quick inspection on him? Of course, I haven't had this, uh, this luxury in the past. This is so nice just to be able to, uh, you know, to come in and uh, do a quick review right on the spot as the parts are coming off. Dirty, but otherwise quite serviceable. Okay, I'll put him aside. A little lighting adjustment there. A little focus adjustment. And let's take off this um, this wheel that's sitting on top of the uh, barrel. Okay. And we're just going to add a little bit of a little bit of helper there in the form of an unprotected finger. Now this movement is so small, I find I'm using my uh, smallest of tweezers throughout the process. So there he is. Okay, so that screw holds in the ratchet wheel. Put him aside. Okay, ratchet wheel comes out. He lifts off. There's the other side. Looking good. We can remove the click. So there's the click spring. Okay. That was fairly successful. We'll remove the click. Oh, that was a lucky catch. Okay, so there's the screw that held in the click. And here's the click. And the click is directional. You can see the little post that points down that engages with the click spring. Okay. I'm thinking maybe we want to take off the train wheel bridge, which will release all the wheels at the same time. So there's one screw and these are nice tall screws and they have a tall head on them. Sometimes they don't want to let go. So if you just hold the screw still and turn the movement, it will uh, release. So that is indeed the same screw. Okay, remember what's next. We're going to go along the side of the bridge and, and look for a pry point. Oh, we don't want to bang into the wheels there. And we are kind of fighting the, the uh, movement holder just a bit. It's in the way, but I think we can get this. So very gently. There we go. That's all we need to do. Just dislodge it. Grab a hold. And there is a chance that sometimes the wheels stick. Whoops. Sometimes the wheels will, like, don't do that. That was an example of what not to do. But sometimes the wheels will stick to the underside of the bridge. So now that we have these other wheels revealed, let's take off the barrel bridge. And the barrel bridge is held in by one, two, three screws. Okay, that's one. Now I'd like to assume that 
all of the, uh, you know, I do feel like this is just a little bit too large. So I'm going to go down one more. We're going to try the yellow screwdriver. See if that wants to uh, play more nicely with this bridge. Yes, very nice. That's two. And here's three. And you can see the uh, that barrel bridge is, is very willingly trying to volunteer itself off of the movement. He wants to go. This last one. There we go. I would say he's the same as well. And I don't think we're going to have to pry. I think this is just going to come right off. I want to just try to make sure we lift it straight off so as not to do that. Okay. Again, um, no big deal. This is part of the learning process. That's the underside. That's the presentation side. There's the pretty side. And while we're here, let's take advantage of our microscope power. And I'll shed a little bit more light on the subject. Not bad for an old timepiece. Let's just keep disassembling. We can further inspect these parts, you know, after a good cleaning or or after getting them all in, in the tray. And it looks like he's got some pivot left on him. And finally, the escape wheel. And look how small that pivot is. That's so tiny. Now, should I be picking him up by the wheel part? And I see that he's kind of slid under. Looks like a cutout in the, uh, the main plate. Grab him by the pinion. Oh, there we go. Look at that. He slides out the side. I guess that is... Um, by design, perhaps because this is such a uh, teeny, tiny movement. Very interesting. Okay, I, I if I didn't know that, and if he just sort of fell out, I wouldn't have known that he slides out from the side. So when we put him back in, we slide him in. Here's the barrel that holds the mainspring. He just lifts out. There's the underside. And you can see right in the, uh, the bottom there, you can see the coils of the mainspring. Are the keyless works trying to volunteer themselves? Yes, they are. Okay, here's that sliding clutch. Put them aside. Here's the wheel that interfaces with the sliding clutch. Looks like he has all his teeth. Excellent. This is the uh, setting lever screw. And let's see, when we unscrew this, there's a very good chance the setting lever is going to drop out the back. You can see him getting ready there in the, in the background. There he goes. Setting lever screw should now lift out, and it does. Here's our setting lever. OK, 
Okay, it looks like this retaining plate holds just about all the remaining components down. So that's nice and efficient. It's got one big screw here. Get a good look at the profile there so we can identify it, put it back. Okay, this plate just sits on those two posts. So we just want to lift them straight up. Come on. There we go. Interesting looking plate there. Now I think that this is the plate that is broken and, and there was the spring for the setting lever was attached there. So if we're gonna ever make this movement breathe again, we're gonna to have to replace that part. Okay, he goes to the side. Here's the yoke. And that yoke sat on that post. Okay. Put him in the bin. There's the yoke spring. It looks like the tension's off of him. And what are we left with? Okay, we've got two wheels, two little intermediate wheels. And these, when you're setting the watch, they transfer the crown motion to the center wheels, which move the hands. There we go, there's one. And should lift right off. Super teeny tiny. I, I like to do this. I'm sorry. I, I can't resist. I want to keep on reintroducing that 10 cent dime coin into the picture so you can just get an idea. I mean, this wheel is smaller than his nose. Okay. Put him on safely aside. And with that, is there anything else left? You know, there is. We have um, we have a couple of jewels. We have a jewel that gets unscrewed there. Jewel there. I'm gonna prepare, I have my my Rodico, this green putty. Rodico on a stick. I'm just going to make a little helper there. So um, when I do loosen up the screws for those jewels, rather than have to use the tweezers and possibly send them flinging into infinity, I'll just use the uh, Rodico to pick them up and transfer them to my parts bin. Okay, we'll introduce ourselves to the screw. And there it goes. It's coming out. Come back here. Getting a little bit of magnetism. Oh! Okay. All right. There he is. Got him. So here's what I'm talking about. We just do a little touch. And that lifts that cap. So this is a, a two-part jewel. It's got a cap, and then it has a matching jewel on the bottom with a hole in it. Can I get these side by side, both in focus? Okay, so there's the cap jewel. That's solid. And then this jewel is embedded into the movement. That's the one with the hole in it that the pivot goes through. And then this capsule, you put a drop of oil on it, and then you re-sandwich it on top of the whole jewel. There we go. There's a bevel on the screw hole, and that part faces up to accept the screw head. So there's one, same drill. 
and most likely the screw and the cap jewel in its mount are most likely identical to the one that we just removed. Okay, cap jewel with the whole jewel underneath it. And with that, I think we have an empty main plate. Very nice. Okay, if this was going to be a rebuild, we would send all of this to the cleaners. So here's a quick look through the microscope at all the parts that we removed. There's that fragment of the uh, setting lever return spring that broke off. Very nice. Mainspring, let's open up the mainspring barrel. Okay, and we just want to use a, a hard surface here. Should we microscope it? Sure, why not? This is about microscopy. Mike Roscopy. Mike Mike Roscopy. I'm just gonna do a firm push. And that should pop off the lid. So what I want to do now is see if I can slide the tweezers under the lid and keep the spring in place. Because when the lid comes off, I don't want the spring going crazy. Good, I think that's going to stay. And next thing we want to do is remove the arbor that's in the center. Tell you what, let's, let's put it on one of these holes. So it drops down into place and it doesn't, doesn't rock. I believe that we have it unhooked. Come on. Nope, got him out. Okay. Let me find him. I know he traveled a, a short distance because I heard him land on the desk. I didn't hear him fall. Um, here's a little tip. I keep a uh, flashlight handy um, so I can just kind of sweep the beam and if you uh, if you go low sometimes you can see. We'll, uh, we'll find him in just a bit. I'm gonna keep rolling. Um, normally I would go like hand over hand with this mainspring to get it out. It's so small. These tweezers are a little finer. So there's one. Oh, of course, now it's just flopping all over the place. This little trick. I'm just going to take a piece of Rodico. Can we make the Rodico stick to our Little block there. Take our barrel. Stick them on the Rodico. And now at least maybe it won't jump around as much. So far, this is the most awkward step. Okay. And now is that giving us enough to kind of hold on to? So I think we'll just let them unwind like this in a nice controlled fashion. Can I do it all fingers here? Let's see. Now 
part of me doesn't want him springing up and whacking into the lens of the microscope. So I think we almost made it. Yay, there it is. Okay. Leave him there. All right, that was so much fun. I'm really enjoying the microscope and I know that there's more of a learning curve um, to getting my coordination working underneath, you know, looking through the eyepieces. But I thought that went very well. Um, I love having the stereo microscope so you can judge your uh, depth perception. And it, it's very empowering. This movement was so small, um, I would have found it completely daunting um, trying to work on it with either a loop or, or just, you know, looking through, uh, just using my natural eyesight. The microscope was so helpful. I, I feel completely empowered. Thank you so much for watching. Um, I want to thank many of my new subscribers. The channel is closing in on 3,000 subscribers. So thank you. Thank you to all of you who have been there from the beginning and, and we've picked up along the way. I'm really enjoying the journey and I'm really enjoying hearing from you. And I look forward to your comments down below. Um, thank you so much for your comments on the previous video about the microscope. Like I said, many of those comments helped me make the adjustments that I made in this video. And if you have more comments, keep them coming. It's been fantastic. I'm Mike, the channel is Watch With Mike. I look forward to our next time together. Bye-bye.